Hey there, I pray this video encourages you and helps you grow and become more like Jesus. Follow along with the notes linked in the description. And don't forget to hit the subscribe button. Enjoy. It's good to be with you in, in my home church. Uh, I felt like I'm a guest speaker today. I've been downstate so much. In fact, I'm down there the next two weeks again. But it's a joy to be here. And I'm under an assignment today from our pastor, Pastor Ryan, who has given me an assignment. And he wanted me to be very open and very, uh, I guess, just let it all hang out about our family growing up, how it came to be, I'm where I am today. He feels that's part of the blueprint for family living. So it's a privilege to fulfill that assignment today, and we trust it will minister to you. Uh, the title is Modeling the Mission, and that's something that my parents did, and I'll explain all that. But I have a subtitle that I feel should be slipped in there, and that is this, that my parents were there. That phrase, I want you to just let that resonate with you. My parents were there. It wasn't easy, but they were there. And there's a word I want you to get very comfortable with today and put it back in your dictionary of your family. And that word is protection. Protection. What I want you to see today is that my and Angela's healing became a wall of protection for our children to not have to ever experience. And so she will be here next week. I'm doing it this week. I'll be gone the next two weeks, so you, she'll be here to, and I'll find out what she says about me. Don't you worry, I'll find out. <laughs> and uh, no, I've given her permission. I've given her permission. Let her hang out, hon. This is what we're here to do. Uh, so my subtitle was, my parents were there in that moment. Pastor Ryan read the scripture, I saw I won't today, but in Deuteronomy 6, there were, I saw four things that were happening here. When you sit, when you walk, when you lie down, when you rise up, uh, there was this, represented this continuous thing. It had to do with a continuous life style at all these points in time. Walking, sitting, eating, lying down, rising up, going to work. Four things. It spoke of family togetherness. It spoke of the development of a child's spirituality. It spoke of children would know what to face because that's what they had to learn to do as parents back then. Tell them what had happened to you, what's in the future. And as a result of all of this, first three, that it would result in children knowing how to live and what to be like in life, period. That was the four things it encompassed. And I'm sure you read it, you can find more things. Now, in chapter 11 of Deuteronomy, it's the same kind of scripture reading, the exact same four points they covered, sitting down, rising up, in chapter 11. And verse 7 said something that was very interesting, because the first six verses of chapter 11 of Deuteronomy had to do with what their children didn't know because they were not taught those things. And in verse 7, it said in Deuteronomy eleven seven, 7, but it was your own eyes that saw all these great things the Lord had done. But it was your own eyes that saw all these great things the Lord has done. So as it's leaving the, the understanding that if the kids didn't know what happened and the parents saw all these great things happening, what should parents do when they've had great experiences with the Lord in their life? What should they do with that information? Well, when the kids sit down, when they rise up, when they walk by the way, when they eat, you should, I should be in, in just giving that information out. And so we come to this very important question, that being the case, for what you know or what you don't know, listen carefully. For what you do know as parents or grandparents or don't know as parents or grandparents about God and his work over the years, what do you know? What do you know? So for what you know or what you don't know, that 
is what's being passed on to your children today. So if I don't know much about God, guess what? I, I'm going to be honest with you. I, I guess I'm not passing much on about God. If I know a lot about God in my life today, because I've been serving the Lord, then it looks like I've got a lot I should be passing on to my children. Because I'm going to tell you something right now. They're getting a lot of information off their technology. A lot of information I don't think you want them to know or have. And we need to hear about that. I'd like to give a definition of a word that I think is very important in the dictionary. I just believe this is a key thing for family life, all-encompassing. And that word is atmosphere. What is the atmosphere of our home? What does that mean? The word atmosphere means a surrounding environment or influence. Now, there's the atmosphere out there. There's all kinds of definitions. But the one that is applicable for this today is simply this. It is a surrounding environment or influence. What surrounds our family, period? What are the influences that circumpass our family life today? What surrounds your home? What influences exist in our home? Now, what was modeled in our home growing up was that we learned as to how we should live our lives. In other words, the better caught than taught. That was what was very important in our home growing up. And uh, Sister Angela will share next week what was to her experience in the home. But in our home growing up, uh, we learned how to live our lives. I mean, my, my parents, and I'll give you some examples here, but let me first define this word atmosphere. What, what do I mean by influence and atmosphere? What, where is that coming from? Ready? The kind of music you listen to in your home and have playing in your home or in your car or on television. And, and by the way, uh, sometimes we get so caught off with the music that we like the music. I'm a classical guy. I like classical music. I pray by it, study by it, listen to it, can listen to it all, all day long. I love classical music. And uh, be it Christian classical or regular classical music. But you know what we don't pay attention to sometimes with all the music's going on because we like the music. We're not listening to the lyrics. And some of those lyrics that are being sung are very humanistic, very secular, uh, not, not good ideology. So we need to be paying attention to the lyrics. What about the TV shows that we watch? Is the Bible in plain view during the week or is it covered up with Monday morning's newspaper until next Sunday? And then someone's saying, Dad, Mom, where's your Bible? The Bible being seen or read in front of the children is very important. I saw my mom and dad read the Bible. I saw this. I could learn it must be an important book, couldn't I? Because yeah. I was all the time reading it. My mother especially was all the time reading the Bible. The subject of Jesus being discussed in the home. When's the last time you sat at dinner table and actually brought up the subject of Jesus? Has the conversation ever come up? Do we ever talk about Jesus and about God and the things of God with our children? Because Deuteronomy 6 is, is 7 said they hadn't been told these things, the first six verses. But you have seen them as parents. You know what great things God has done. Are we telling our kids? Are we actually taking time to tell our kids about how good God is? I tell you what, folks, when we had family devotions with our kids growing up, it wasn't just wang, bang, and we're done, go to bed, have a good night's rest. We got into discussions about the Bible, about life, about values and morals. We had questions and question and answering sessions with our kids. I remember that. Just not as much when they were younger, you know, because they were still learning. Little little sneak story when we would teach the kids the Old Testament when we be the Psalms 150 that bless the Lord with uh, tam tambourine and dancing and we would have the kids sometimes repeat after us the scripture verses so one day here's Ryan he's going to repeat the word uh, bless the Lord with uh, tambourine and dancing he said bless the Lord with tangerine and dancing <laughs> And I, I don't tell them I told you, but that was just such a cute little thing. Uh, tangerines and dancing. So. 
But seeing mom and dad, for instance, solving, re resolving conflicts, which taught us how to have an argument and still get, uh, get along together. You know, some parents don't think it's right to argue from the children. I, I, I'm going to lovingly disagree. Now, name calling, fist swinging, shoving, and I don't mean that kind of stuff. I'm talking about a good, healthy, hot debate going on. It's okay if the kids here and see that, if it's the appropriate material, of course. And because we're teaching them how to argue and how to fix things and resolve. I saw my mom and dad get into some hot ones, but five minutes later they could be laughing and carrying on because they had forgiven each other. The best definition of forgiveness I learned growing up was watching my parents. Which I find out as you grow up that that's a Bible thing. So my, my parents were carrying out a Bible thing of forgiving each other on a regular basis. And so it taught me how to be forgiving. It taught me that. So an affection in front of us. It's okay to show affection in, in, in front of your children. And holding hands, putting your arms around them. You know, all kinds of stuff. It's, it's okay. They need to learn how to do that. They need to learn that. Uh, not hearing a parent lie on the phone. Well, tell him I'm not here. Here, I'll, 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 I'll run to the shower. And so, the, well, he just stepped into the shower. You missed him. Well, he might be in the shower, but how come there ain't no water running? Because his clothes are on. He, he wasn't taking a shower. But you see, what happens is, we, if we model that kind of behavior in front of our children, we're teaching our children how to lie, folks. It's called a lie. You, you, you may call that a, a, a little white lie. I've never found in my Bible the scripture verse that talks about white lies. In fact, it's written in black ink. It is a lie. It's a lie. Okay? Not white ink. All right. Modern chores being done in front of us. Getting ready for church on a regular basis. And listen to this one. Not just getting ready to go to church on a regular basis, but actually looking forward to going. If your kids think you're sitting here today because you had to be, because it's the thing you do on Sunday, we're not helping our children. But if we're saying, guys, we're going to go to church and we're going to have a ball, and hey, you listen well in junior church and you're going to tell me at dinner table today, what did you, my wife always did that. So what did you guys learn today in Sunday school? She would do that on a regular basis. I remember. What did you guys learn? She wanted to know, did they get it? And what was being taught? See, this just misses a few of the elements that make up an atmosphere or an influence that impacts a child's life. What goes on in the home. This doesn't include the philosophical or the physiological aspects in the home. That's a whole different direction. This is the kind of stuff that happened in our home. My parents were there, though. They were there. By that I mean there in the moment. They were present mentally, emotionally, not just physically. Now, my dad was, as I said, was a hard man, so sometimes he wasn't always there connecting with us emotionally, uh, but, but he learned to. Hmm. Not at the beginning, because, again, he came out uh, a, a very hard man, so he had to learn how to trust and grow. So, listen, uh, there are three things a parent needs to know to pay attention to. Grandparents, you need to know to pay attention to this. There's nothing wrong with you grandparents. Hey, listen, I'm going to say something very bold. Don't leave it all up to your children to minister to your grandchildren. You help your children minister to your grandchildren. You help them do that. So you pay attention to what the parents do, and you, you try to roll that to the children, grandchildren. Let them see this is a team effort. This is a team effort. Amen? Amen. So, children, three things. Children hear things. We need to know this. They are hearing our language. They're hearing what we say all the time. If they're in our present, don't think they're not sometimes sitting on the stairway listening downstairs in the TV room to what you're watching, to what you're talking about. These are things you got to pay attention to. And I, I remember one time that uh, we just got here to Delaware and uh, I saw Aaron outside sitting underneath the tree in the front yard. He had his legs crossed, had his head sitting on his lap like this, and he's picking up twigs and grass, and he's throwing it down. And I could see they was very dejected. I said, something's wrong. So I went outside. He's five years old. I went outside, sat down. Aaron, what's wrong, bud? What's wrong? 
Ah, oh, Dad, I'm dumb. I said, dumb? I said, son, there is no such word in our dictionary. It doesn't exist. That word doesn't exist. Where did you get that? Uh, my friend down the street, he said, you're dumb. Now look at this impact. If you don't think you should be worried about what your kids are doing online, listen to this. One comment from one friend knocked him to the ground in discouragement. One comment. You are dumb. Now he's the last kid that's dumb. And I'm going to tell you something. Those words didn't come out of our mouth growing up in our home. They did not exist in the Coon Dictionary. We had our own dictionary. They were not there. They were for me growing up, though. And I felt every one of them. And you know what's the dangerous part about what I'm talking about in this book, Kids Here? Is I believed I was all the things I was called, which affected me. And I'll tell you about that. Number two, they see things. How we act, how we conduct ourselves. And here's the hard one, number three. They feel things even when they are smiling and appear to be okay. They're still feeling things. Don't underestimate what appears to be a happy smile, but rather a hurting smile trying to be resilient in the pain they are feeling. You've got to pay close attention and investigate what are you feeling about things. As parents, we need to evaluate our conduct and conversations to determine what our children may be feeling based on our behavior. While they are forming their views and beliefs, they are forming them based on our behaviors and lifestyle. That's where they learn. That's where they learn. I know I'm preaching to the choir, but sometimes choirs sing the same song twice. Okay? <laughs> So let's go a little bit deeper. Again, as I am a parent, so as I am as a parent, so my children tend, say tend, they tend to become. Doesn't mean they become everything. They, they tend to become. So my reactions become their reactions. My beliefs become their beliefs. My expressed feelings become their expressed feelings. My attitudes can become their attitudes. But I, I want to give a couple examples here on my beliefs part. Did our beliefs in the home have an impact? is a good question to ask. So I remember one time that Aaron was playing football for CR, and afterwards he, was, he would normally go to the youth group. Well, afterwards he was invited to a party out in the field somewhere, so he thought he'd check that out that night. It's after the game, so he drove out there, and from a distance he could see the party going on. He didn't like what he heard. He didn't like what he felt. And he turned around, got in his car, and went back to the youth group. That's part of the belief system that was coming out of him. That was part of the belief system. Brian wouldn't play football for Polytech in his senior year. They wanted him to play. He wouldn't play because he wanted to be in the youth group. He said, Dad, I, I believe I belong in the youth group. I said, that fi son, that's fine. You go for it. Well, near the end of the season, they really wanted him to play. They, were, they didn't have a kicker. And he, so... He thought he would go ahead and help them the last three games. And it was so interesting. The first game he went back to on a Friday night. And by the way, as soon as the game was over, they went back to the youth group. But the first game, they knew they had a bad kicker in the Polytech team. So it was time for my son to kick a punt. And some kid was real close up. And Ryan went like just during the game. He was motioning the kicker, receiver to get back. Now, what, a, what kind of confidence is that? So what Ryan does, he gets the ball, he kicks, you ready for this? I am not joking, you guys. He kicked a 65-yard punt. It rose 65 yards, and the guy was trucking back to get the ball. He overestimated. And, and all I'm saying is that even though God blessed him to be in the youth group, God blessed him to kick a good, good punt that night, you know, to help the team out. Listen, folks. My overall lifestyle becomes my child's understanding of life and God. By the way, the reason I give the illustration about Ryan, I forgot to mention, I think God honored his convictions about being in the youth group and blessed him on the football field for three games. That's why I said that. I think he was honoring him. 
So my overall lifestyle, because my child's understanding of life and God, whether positive or negative, if I'm too stern, it can turn, turn them off to God. If I don't live what I preach, it can confuse them. A father in the first, is the first representative of the Heavenly Father. Did you hear that, dads, granddads? We are the first representative of our Heavenly Father. How our children perceive their father makes a lasting imprint on their view of God. Because fathers are supposed to be like God. And they're authority figures. You want to be a positive, strong authority figure, granddad and dad, then get spiritual. Get more of God. Have more of God coming out of your life. Let them see what is the most important thing to have. I, I said this in the service this morning. There's an awful lot of degrees out there that you fight for and you live for and you go for. Good. But if we don't have the degree of God, we are missing the most important degree we can ever have behind our name. You can put all kinds of titles behind your name, honey, but God's got to be the number one degree that we work on in our lives, especially in our time in which we are living. In a time in which we are living. My parents were my best definition of who God was. They were the best. Rough around the edges, but they were the best. They were the best. My personal example, here we go. My parents were dysfunctional in many ways. And by that I mean they had low self-worth and insecurities. And my mom was riddled with fear. Um, one day we was visiting my mom and dad in Delaware. They moved out from Michigan and we left the house. And my wife, sitting beside me in the car, she said, Hon, you have the most dysfunctional family. <laughs> and I didn't say anything. God silenced my mouth. I couldn't say anything. I was confused. I thought I had a perfect upbringing. That's how dysfunctional I was. I thought I was in a perfect environment growing up. Now, it was wonderful in so many ways because I went to church as a kid. I grew up in the things of God. I had Christian parents. Slow coming on my dad's part, but right there with my mom's part. So, you know, but that struck me. And all of a sudden I realized I did have a dysfunctional family. That's how dysfunctional I was. I didn't even know was dysfunctional. I thought I was perfect. Not perfect in the sense, absolute perfect like God. I mean, you know what I mean. I, I didn't think I had all those problems. But she saw them and my parents and she's, we, that opened up doors of conversation and eventually my healing. That very statement was a turning point in my life. Thanks, babe. So here we go. Because I had grown up in it, I had become accustomed to the way they related and thought it was normal. Yes. Let me say that again. Because I had grown up in this, I had become accustomed to the way they related and thought it was a normal way of living. I didn't realize how off I was. I thought I had, again, that good upbringing. So... Let me define this function so that you won't take it in the extreme way it can be met. Thinking, and I quote, thinking becomes a pattern of living, what we think we live, which becomes an obstacle to seeing your life clearly, causing you to jump to conclusions, assuming the worst and distorting the facts. I have to read that again. Thinking becomes a pattern which becomes obstacles to seeing your life clearly, causing you to jump to conclusions, assuming the worst and distorting the facts. And that was me. I would distort the truth because I, I thought I knew the truth. I didn't know the other side of truth for living like that. Dad spent a few years in a youth detention home incarcerated because of his street life in Detroit, Michigan. He was in the gangs, all time in gang fights. Robin still in his life of crime began after 18 years in prison. It all began by stealing money out of milk bottles on people's porches. So we would put our milk bottles out in Detroit and the milk truck would come by and he would replace it, take the money out of the empty jars of money. Well, he would go along after the 
people put their money, and he'd be looking around, he'd go up to a porch, take the money out of the milk bottle, so there was no money there for the milkman to leave milk. He said, son, that was my life of crime. That's where it began. And 18 years later, he gets saved, and he was in five years, five years, five years, and then three years, his third time in, fourth time in, they considered him an habitual criminal. There was an article in the newspaper about my dad in Lansing, Michigan, about him being a habitual criminal, but God saved him in his last three years, and they let him out. He had one other occasion where he made a mistake and he almost got back into prison, but, but the man didn't press charges because he was messing around with a woman's purse that wasn't my dad's, if you know what I mean, because he just didn't carry purses around. He was in somebody else's purse. He didn't belong, but that man gave him a reprieve. He got saved his last three years. I used to visit my dad in prison as a little boy, but he came out a hard man, even though he was saved. He was harsh. He was controlling his way or the highway. If you badmouthed my dad and you stood here, five seconds later, you were rolling around on the floor with one swing of his hand. He, he just didn't tolerate that kind of stuff. He was a stubborn man. He was a prideful man because of his insecurities, because of his low self-worth. He was doing the best he thought he should be doing, raising kids. Well, guess where that hardness and influence impacted itself? Where do you think it went? On those children. On those children. Now, mom was raised in a dysfunctional home and never went past seventh grade in school. Never went past seventh grade. Her dad was stabbed to death in a bar fight and her mom was an alcoholic. It was a very unstable home which created a lot of fear in her. And uh, the, although my, my mother was never past seventh grade, when it came to the things of God, she sounded like a graduate from Bible college. She was so wise in the word. She was, I told my wife more than once, hon, over the years, my mom was my best counselor. The wisdom that she had of God, which showed me you can have all the education in the world, but if you don't have God, you don't have enough. Amen. You have enough. <laughs> Fear is a big thing when growing up in all in a dysfunctional home, put fear with a low self-worth and insecurities, you've got it bad. <laughs> but you still think that's normal because that's how you were raised. So I thought a lot of things that was with me was all normal because of how I was raised. It passed on. Now you see the importance of that word protection. Now you see the importance of that word protection I talked about. We've got to protect our kids from those things they hear and see out there by us modeling what should be heard and seen out there. So they have something to compare. So they know what's right and what's wrong. That's our job, to present them what is right and what is wrong by our lifestyle, etc. My mom had this fierce fear of storms. And in Michigan, you would hear that horn going off, a potential, you know, severe tornado warning. We had a lot of those in Michigan where I lived. And, and so there they go off. And my mom would grab us kids and run to the basement. And the dog would beat us every time. <laughs> she even instilled fear in the dog. But not my dad. My dad was a brave man. Oh, baloney. Go ahead. I'm not coming down. Leave me alone. He's standing on the porch in an electrical storm with the wind blowing. He, he would do it on purpose just to show you that it can't hurt you. It, it can. He just, God was good to him. <laughs> he, he, he was good to his bra bravery. And so uh, my mother moves out to Delaware, and, and guess what happened? The first storm that was given here in Delaware, she asked to come over and go to the basement. I said, yeah, Mom, you're welcome to go to the basement. <laughs> or she'd go to Wayne and Nina's house, cross the street to their basement if we weren't available. She had to be in the basement. Because that was her belief. Something bad's going to happen. And so over the years, as a young adult, as I grew up, I started developing a nervous stomach when there was a threatening storm. I literally would get a nervous, physiologically, I would get a nervous stomach. I was, I had a, what I called a silent fear. I didn't talk about it, I didn't speak about it, but silently I was fearful of a coming impending storm because of all of our experience. So I finally said to my mom one day, I said, Mom, why? I said this to her after they moved out, why are you so afraid of storms, Mom? Son, when we was a little girl, we had a tornado coming to Middlesbrough, Kentucky. It tore the town up. It literally, she said this, 
The one thing my mother wouldn't do is lie. She says, son, it would take the rubble tracks out of the ground and it twisted them like licorice stick, just twisted them all up. And I was so afraid. She said, I've been afraid ever since. A few months go by, we have storms. She's coming over to my house, or Dinah's house. I walk in the house one day, she says, son, I've got some good news. I said, what, mom? God healed me. I'm no longer afraid of storms. Now she's in a trailer, and she's not afraid of storms. <laughs> uh, mom, I'd like to tell you something about those trailers, but I'm not gonna say anything, you know. I'm gonna keep that one a little silent, mom. Uh, but you know what? Guess what happened after that? Now think of the physiological, think of the psychological impact, the psychosomatic impact it had on my life. All of a sudden, I was healed of my nervous stomachs. Not a word was said. No one said a word. Here comes a, a storm threatening Delaware. Went right through it. Not one stomach ache since. Isn't that beautiful? That is so beautiful. That's, that's uh, uh, the awareness of God's touch. See, that kind of a thing may not mean a lot to you, but it meant a lot to me because I was tired of stomach aches. Okay? Now, where do you think dysfunctional and lifestyle went to us children? And yet, we knew we were always loved. That's one thing they did. Now, are you ready for how we could feel loved in the middle of a crippling influence in our home? I'll tell you how. If there was only one way we could do it, and I'm going to hit it again. It could only have been, and it was, only God. There's not a book on the market that can do except God's Word. There's not a book on the market except God's Word can do what God can do. There's not a doctor that can do what God can do. There's not a psychologist or psychiatrist or sociologist or a hypnotist person can do what God does. God is the ultimate physician and healer. Mom and dad had a relationship with God. They pursued him, read his word and prayed. They worked at obeying the word. Mom and dad told us that they loved us, sold it, took care of our needs, did things with us, fishing, games, family activities, had devotions. But again, their insecurities became mine amidst that. And that's where From Prisoner to Preacher took place. I, my dad and I talked. We should write a book, Dad. From Prisoner, which is you, to Preacher, which was me. We never got it into print, but we wanted to do it so bad to show what God could do. Because statistically, in those days, if you had a dad that was like that, statistically, they thought I was going to be just like him. But God. The results of this dysfunction that I grew up thinking, I grew up thinking that I couldn't do anything good enough in life. I remember that, uh, again, my parents' self-worth and experience became mine. I remember in Olivet, Michigan, one night, I crawled into bed at 3 o'clock in the morning. The church was next door to the, the parsons was next door to the church, new parsons, new church, but I was invited to be the preacher, and I was there for six years. And uh, so, my, in my first year, I crawled into bed at 3 o'clock in the morning. That's after a 16-hour workday in this small country church. And I laid in bed, and I looked up to God. This is a true story. I laid in bed, I looked up to God, and I said, God, I feel like I haven't done anything for you today. What pastor works 16-hour shifts, and one day, 16 hours, and can say, God, I feel like I didn't do anything for you. And I never stopped working for the church. I took time to eat. I'm not talking about my eating time. I'm talking about work time. I became a workaholic because I became a perfectionist because I was so ugly feeling inside. I thought I had to be all these things on the outside to try to feel good about myself. That's what perfectionism does. It makes you go beyond the normal <laughs> to try to feel good about who you are inside. So I knew I was lacking. I knew I was in trouble. I knew I was in trouble after that. So as my parents grew in the Lord, I saw changes in the life that helped me. Because of all the changes in our home, they worked hard to raise us in the things of God. In other words, my parents were there in the moment, paying attention, doing the best they could, going to church, helping the poor by bringing the poor and the needy into our home to live. Working in the church through ministries, visiting nursing homes and homes of the sickly. 
They ran our church bus ministry for several years. Big yellow buses going around town, picking up kids, feeding them on the bus. My mom and dad took care of all that. Having family devotions on a regular basis, being in home groups, prayer meetings, giving missionaries their brand new bikes to the mission field, which I wanted. <laughs> but he gave them to the missionary. That was a good cause, though. It was a good cause. They gave their bikes to the missionary. A tithing. Where do you think I learned to tithe? I learned to tithe from my parents. Giving their clothes away. All the time giving clothes away to the needy. My dad would take his shirt off the back. Now, what do you think? Oh, and, and by the way, my dad was granted something that is unheard of in Michigan. Back in the day, they gave my dad and mom five prisons, including the one he was in for 18 years, to go back and be a chaplain to the prisoners. Five of them. And by the way, that ministry over 40 years is still going on to this day. I talked to the guy who runs it. Now, what do you think this influence with the overall atmosphere in our home did to me growing up? Because my parents were there in the moment modeling their relationship with God and being missional, I learned to grow up in the work of God and in all of our home. They made it a priority, so it became a priority to me. I went to church. I tithed. I prayed to have my own devotions beyond our family devotions. By the way, in the interest of time, I'm not going to read that long list of things. You name it, I did it. And most of the things that I did do out of my long list I could have read you, by the way, included all kinds of things in the ministry. By the way, my parents, and most of them, led the way for me to see. Led the way for me to experience in my life. I wasn't perfect, but I learned through mistakes and I grew from what I learned. Why was all this possible? Because my parents were there in my life doing their best to raise us in understanding who God was. And with all their dysfunction in their lives, they grew and became godly people. They were godly people. Putting their Christian lifestyle and mine growing up, we had become what Pastor Ryan wanted me to talk about today, a missional family. My parents led the way in the things of God now, I'm going to say something that sounds crazy. Don't go home and do this. I'll get in trouble with the boss. <laughs> the two bosses. Well, three. I've got my wife. I've got Ryan. I've got God. I'll be in trouble with three bosses. My parents did so much church. If we never had a church to go to, we had church. And everything you can think about what a church does today, they did it. That was my atmosphere. That was my influence growing up. Hence, I stand here today, a retired pastor, because it was in front of me. I learned that the most important thing in life was knowing and experiencing God. In the middle of all my low self-worth and, and insecurities, God showed me how much he loved me as I was, and he changed my life. I received a tremendous healing over 30 years ago that how much I discovered how much God loved me. It changed my life forever. Because it sunk in. I love you as you are. And I'll change the things in you. I want to change. But I love you as you are. God loves you today, church, as you are. And he'll change you where he wants to. This doesn't mean God calls everyone to full-time ministry, but he did me. The things he called me to do that I never thought I could do, he made sure I could. The things I didn't think I could ever do in the ministry, he made sure I did. Supernaturally. I've really wrestled with this, to share this today. I really did, because I didn't want to be misunderstood. But when I went to Valley Forge, it's now University of Valley Forge, uh, I didn't know this, but I was sent a letter from the college that liked to have me at the graduation ceremony, we want to give you an award. I was called up to the platform during the graduation ceremony at University of Valley Forge, and I was given an award a plaque for 10 years of professional service in the work of God. The college had submitted my name to be voted upon, and I received it. 10 years later, I didn't know this, they had a 20-year award to give. So they submit names. I was voted in again. Received a second award for professional achievement. 
and professional conduct. Only this time, I was inducted into the, uh, uh, what they call it, uh, Delta Chi Honor Society for Association of American uh, Bible Colleges, an honorary uh, membership, which was, wow, I didn't expect that. And then to find out, I didn't know this at all until I got another letter from Valley Forge. There was a third prestigious award given out. They awarded me that, and I was called to another uh, graduation ceremony exercise for 40 years of professional achievement. And I thought to myself, only God. He took me, he took me from a person who was low self-worth and securities, and he gave me some honor that I didn't expect, but he made that much of a difference in my life to have earned those awards, all but because of God. Amen. Amen. And I, I close with this, and I thank you for letting me run over this a little bit. I, hate, I don't want to get in trouble with your boss. Tell him to call me, and I'll get you off the hook. Here's God's plan for our family, folks. Ephesians and Colossians are sister books. If you look at these two books and read them side by side, each chapter, you're going to find out something. God deals with the individual in the first part of the, each of these books. Near the end of these books, the second thing he deals with is the marriage. Ephesians 5, Colossians talks about it. And the third thing it talks about in Ephesians and in Colossians in the last couple chapters, it talks about children. The fourth thing it talks about is vocation, what you do for a living. You see, one thing that's hurting families today is that we got number four on number top, number one. And folks, we, we, we can't afford to do that. We, we've got to bring, understand that if I'm strong individually, then I can help my wife to be strong and she can help me be strong as a marriage. Now through our strength in God, we can help our children to become strong. Now we go to work. You see, God is first, the family second, and our work is third. If we will walk in this divine order of life, we will have success. But if we do not walk in this order, we will not have the success that God says we can have. So it starts with God, me with God, us with God, family with God, and then here we stand and do our job in life. So praise the Lord. Have our children seen enough of God, do you think? Have our children heard enough about God with all their hearing out there? Do we know if our children has felt enough about what they believe about God? That God is, in fact, enough. If our kids don't get anything in life, but they have God, they have everything. I know I got done two minutes earlier than this morning at nine, but I've got to share one more thing. My dad and I were driving through East Lansing, Michigan one day together, and he says, son, there was a politician running for office. Boy, I wish I could have the money that man has so I could help you kids more. I looked at my dad. I said, dad, You have given me God, and you've given me all that I need, and the best you could have given me. Amen. Amen. Let's stand to our feet. Stand to our feet. Father, we thank you today. Those of us in online, we just thank you, Lord, for their attention. Father, I thank you for their indulgence to let me run over a little bit. Father God, today you know every family in this church, every individual, every marriage, every family, everyone listening online today. And you know what is needed, Lord. And God, we are not showing any disrespect to degrees. I have one. We're not doing that. What we're saying is, and all that we have in getting this life, you've got to be the number one thing on the list. With what's coming down the pike, oh God, we're going to need you. We are going to need you. 
there's two things going to happen here in the near future. People are going to either run to you or they're going to run from you. And our responsibility is to be a missional church filled, built with missional families that are out there bringing people into the kingdom before it's too late. So heal individuals, heal marriages, heal families, we pray today. And we'll give you the glory. And Father, anybody here doesn't know you or online doesn't know you can pray. Simple prayer, Lord, it sounds like I need you, so I invite you into my life. Forgive me, Father, for my sins, and I accept you as my Lord and Savior. Let us know, folks, if you've prayed that prayer. And we love you, Father, and give everyone who are traveling and watch over them. And everyone prayed in Jesus' name. Amen. By the way, if you need to reach out to me, I've already had two people reach out online from the service this morning. If you need to reach out to me, I'm Pastor Kuhn. And I'm just pastor at calvarydover.org. Pastor at calvarydover.org. Reach out to me. We're here for you. God bless you. We love you. 